And hello, everyone. Welcome to FSU Coach Live. My name is Tim Baghurst, and today's guest is Wayne Moss. He's the Executive Director of the National Council of Youth Sports. Wayne, thank you so much for taking the time to, to share a little bit about your experiences and, and wisdom. If you wouldn't mind, before we begin, just give us a brief history of, of how you got into this position. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, thank you so much for, for having me. i uh, super excited to be here. Uh, you know, it's been, uh, it's been a bit of a long road, but, uh, you know, sort of the long and the short of it is, uh, you know, I was a sports administration graduate uh, at the master's level. I uh, worked in uh, professional sports for a while with the Detroit Lions and the real Cleveland Browns. I'm a little <laughs> bit, yeah, I'm a little bit, uh, I, I'm some kind of way about that because my team is really in Baltimore. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's probably a, a broadcast for another day. Uh, so spent some time in, in uh, football and uh, some time in the park and rec world. 15 years with Boys and Girls Clubs of America, wow. uh, where I led the uh, sports, fitness, and recreation programming around 4,000 clubs around the uh, the country, you no know, military uh, installations abroad. And then the past two years has been with the National Council of Youth Sports, and uh, you know, super excited about the opportunity uh, that this is. When, when you say it's an opportunity, what exactly do you do? Because we don't get to talk to many executive directors. And, and when we do, it's okay, there, there are job opportunities in sports where you can have a career outside of being a coach. So mm -hmm. if you wouldn't mind, what are your day-to-day -day jobs? How do you, what do you do? Well, so first of all, I'll tell you what it is, who we are, and then I'll give a little bit about what I do. And more importantly, what we're up to right now. So the uh, National Council of Youth Sports is a, it's a member organization where we represent a number of different organizations uh, across the country. Some are national community-based organizations like the Pop Warner, mm -hmm. Warner and the AAUs. There are localized, non-affiliated uh, organizations, sort of those mom and pop in some cases, uh, groups that are in the NGB world. Um, like USA Artistic Swimming. And then, you know, there are others that are uh, national governing bodies, but not on the Olympic side, like a USA uh, Lacrosse, Park and Rec organization, uh, organizations, and then uh, some, um, uh, you know, convention and visitors type bureaus, those uh, uh, destination marketing organizations. And so ultimately what we do is we're in the space of helping to support, uh, provide support to, uh, these organizations so that they can concentrate on doing what they do best, uh, which is uh, serving young people. Uh, so that's a bit about who we are. And then I'll share a little bit about what we're up to. So uh, we really are in the space of, you know, looking at how we might transform this youth sport uh, landscape. And how I mean that is, you know, bringing the kind of things that uh, we think are really important right now. Uh, you know, so that looks like uh, bringing youth development training uh, to coaches. That means bringing the uh, kinds of tools and resources that help uh, organizations do the jobs that uh, they need to do. And, you know, doing things like, uh, you know, recognizing organizations for the, uh, the good work uh, that they do, uh, you know, so that we can really uh, determine what those promising practices are uh, so folks don't have to reinvent the wheel. Can you give an example of support that you would provide a, a mom and pop organization in Tallahassee? Yeah, absolutely. So we'll uh, we'll start with one thing that, you know, we're, we're currently involved in. So, for example, you know, background screenings is uh, okay. an important element of uh, your safety program. And sure. We're aligned with an organization called the uh, National Center for Safety. And so, uh, you know, we produced um, uh, some guidelines around what constitutes uh, great uh, screenings. We've endorsed, uh, you know, the National Center for Safety Initiatives as an organization that does a phenomenal job uh, on the background screening side. Practical example of uh, uh, the kind of work we've been involved in in the past, but as we look forward, one of the things that we're looking to do uh, currently uh, as we get later into this year is to stand up 
a continuous improvement process uh, where organizations can begin to look at you know, practices in some key areas uh, that might be in health and safety um, access. And uh, you know, this assessment tool will allow organizations to begin to look at how well they're doing, but then to develop a game plan uh, for the development of uh, you know, practices that they wanna take on moving forward uh, that will help them improve the quality, uh, improve the safety, of their organizations and that this uh, would be one of those opportunities to really be a part of this continuous improvement. Mm. So really your, your, your goal is to be a resource for those organizations using maybe the best practices that might, might exist in another organization to transfer that over and say, here's how everybody can do it based on what we've seen here and what we've seen there or what we've learned from this organization. Absolutely. You know, there's no need to, to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we want to do is lift up uh, those practices that have been uh, great uh, that other organizations have taken on. Uh, let's make sure in this fragmented uh, youth sports space that we begin to uh, come together and, and use some of those practices that, you know, that have worked well. Yeah, you mentioned fragmented, and I think that's a really good term to describe youth sports in America. When you think about what you've seen over your career, and yes, you've been in the professional, you've been in boys and girls clubs and, 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 so, and so on. Where do you see the, um, the challenges that we've, we've experienced in America that we may not see in other sport, in, in other countries? And then also where do you see us kind of making progress to, to, as you alluded to, helping and supporting young children or young, young people? Well, I'll tell you how I think we've arrived at the place that we've arrived at in this fragmented space. Uh, you know, I, I, for the past 30 to 40 years, we've gone from a youth-led, youth-centered approach where young people did their own thing, uh, had fun, organized their own games. We've gone from that to uh, young people being led by adults, uh, adults making up the rules, uh, you know, it being a very adult centric in its approach. I, I think some of that has happened for a variety of reasons, you know, so if we go back, you know, again, 30 to 40 years ago, uh, we saw that there was a, a rise, I think, in, uh, you know, the competitiveness in terms of getting into college. Mm -hmm. And then there was also the rising college cost uh, you know, I think you mix in with that, uh, you know, this notion parents want to make sure that they provide for their children, you know, an opportunity to get a leg up. Uh, you mix into that, uh, you know, the notion of professional sports salaries starting to escalate uh, in, a, in a way. Uh, and then the rise of commercialization of youth sports, all of those things somewhat unrelated, but coming together you know, I think has created this fragmentation, you know, in the market. So I think that's how we got here in, in large part. Uh, and then I think as we think about, you know, what are the, you know, what are some of the solutions, you know, so, you know, we need to be thinking about, uh, you know, first of all, focusing on what's right, you know, measuring uh, what's right, getting the right goals, uh, measuring the right goals, uh, really having some commonality uh, around, uh, what it is that we're ultimately looking to accomplish in the in this youth sports space, and um, you know, I think COVID, believe it or not, uh, has also helped us to understand some of you know what's going on. So you know, in this fragmented space um, during COVID, lots of organizations and groups have begun to you know come together in ways that they weren't doing before. Uh, some of that out of necessity. Uh, some of some of that out of hey we've got more time or, or we had some more time, uh, but also I think that this has you know helped all of us to understand that you know there are some fundamental models that we need to uh, change and reshape uh, if in fact we're we're going to get a better footing around the youth sports space. One of the big topics that comes up time and time again, and maybe not surprisingly, is is sports specialization. And I think it ties in, I see you smiling. <laughs> uh, it ties into this whole idea of 
you know, child must succeed, child must get scholarship, child mm -hmm. must have a chance at going pro, et cetera. Right. Uh, we've, you know, even talking to my students, I get a, a mixed response on this. Some were, yeah, we saw sports specialization a lot and others were, no, I played a variety of sports growing up. What are you seeing from, from your kind of 30,000 foot view on sports specialization? Is it something that that is growing or is it something that we talk a lot about, but really it's it's a uh, it's because of the few who are actually doing it? No, it's a it's a real thing. Uh, there definitely is a lot more sports specialization and this has lots of different ramifications. So, uh, you know, when I when I think about this issue again, I, you know, I've got a uh, an 18 year old son just graduated from high school. He's a lacrosse mm -hmm. player, a wrestler, and I, you know I can even see it in our space. You know, part of what's happened uh, over the years is that there's uh, overlap between the lacrosse season and the and the wrestling season, and so he's forced to, you know, choose in some way. Uh, and so you know, there's this notion that if uh, you know X is good, then X times ten is even better. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And then you know you mix in this notion around you know, the competitiveness around, uh, you know, wanting to get that spot on varsity or that spot uh, as a, uh, as you know, scholarship or, you know, this other thought that maybe I'm going to make it to the league. Um, you know, it, it that really does take on uh, a life of its own with some consequences. Yeah. Well, one of those consequences, is, as you and I both know, are, are injuries and also yeah. burnout. How how do you from from that top down help to to educate those? This is this is where it gets tricky. You want to educate that mom and pop organization or that mom and pop club whose livelihood depends on whether those kids are involved in their program. And yet here you are maybe telling the hey you coming you bringing you know your athletes to your training center six times a week is not a good idea. But without them coming six times a week, they don't have the income. So how do you how do you balance that, knowing that their their financial careers are determined by their participation? Yet we don't want to harm youth. We want to help them develop and grow. Yeah, absolutely. So it is a bit of a tricky kind of thing that we're looking at. So you know, let's just kind of deal with some of the facts first. Uh, you know, so three and a half million young people end up going to the ER for, you know, some injury related thing on an annual basis. And, you know, the CDC and others have suggested that about half of those uh, could be reduced uh, because, you know, these are typically overuse injuries. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there's, some, you know, some acute injuries that occur, but a lot uh, are uh, a result of overuse. We also know you know, that young people, 70% uh, of them are quitting sport by the age of 13. Uh, and then we layer on that the average lifespan of a, a, a youth athlete is only about three years or less than three years. And so we begin to see that, uh, you know, first of all, uh, if we had more young people participating over a longer period of time, we'd have a bigger piece of the pie, if you will. Mm -hmm. so there are economic incentives that uh, some organizations, you know, feel because they're, they're, you know, there are some that are in that for pay space. Uh, you know, I think USA Hockey uh, has done a phenomenal job. Uh, you know, those, are, you know, they uh, a number of years ago started taking a look at the athlete development model and, you know, started looking at short, you know, short-sighted games and uh, began to educate their parent, you know, their constituents and then their parents around why this was Im important. And so, you know, clearly there's a model for uh, that notion of, you know, helping folks to understand uh, the impact of, uh, you know, some of these issues, uh, including uh, specialization are. Uh, so, you know, we can we've got folks that we can point to and help de help uncouple uh, some of this issue. But at the end of the day, I think if we've got, uh, you know, there's incentive to have more kids playing more often, playing a variety of sports, 
that ultimately will build a pipeline for lots of organizations. And for those who are even in that uh, high performance space, you're ultimately going to get a uh, better athlete. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, a great response. Um, well articulated. W when we talk about coaching in the U S and this comes up in my, my classes as well. We, there's such a wide variation of how somebody gets certified or whether they are even certified or have any training. Um, from, from your perspective, where do you think coaches are lacking? What do they need to know that you feel you know, nationwide is, is a problem? Is it just a lack of fundamental coaching or are there specific areas where you feel that coaches are generally weak? I do think there are some very specific areas, and I would start with this notion of uh, youth development as being key uh, to uh, the engagement. So if we look at what typically happens now, you know, it's estimated that, you know, 20 percent of coaches receive some kind of training. That's typically some X's and O's. Uh, you know, by and large, there's probably about 5 percent that are getting uh, training beyond you know, some X's and O's, which means how to work with young people. And mm -hmm. most people are like myself. They've been, you know, their parents and they get pulled into the coaching arena because, you know, the organization yeah. needs somebody to coach. You know, like I was I was there when my son was six. I signed him up, didn't know anybody. And as I'm at the sign up, someone grabbed me and said, hey, I need you to be a coach. And they didn't know me from Adam. Mm -hmm. Did a background check, by the way. I could have been who knows who. Um, and yet I was also out there just trying to, you know, figure it out. So most coaches uh, are well intentioned, are good people, don't necessarily have the skill uh, to, to be in that arena. And that in a lot of, you know, I mean, that's kind of scary that we've got our precious cargo, our young people. Uh, who are being led by people who who, who really don't know. Uh, so again, just a couple of quick things about that. Youth development, I would say, is you know one of the biggest pieces. Uh, and then I think you know uh, thinking of what are the stages of athletic development or athlete development uh, as well, because a lot of what I see, and I'm sure you and others, you know, sometimes you'll see those eight, you know, those eight year olds being led in a practice or at, in a game uh, like they're at Duke University. You know, it's like the plays are being run, stack, stack. My kids don't even know what that means. Right. Uh, but, you know, we're practicing all of these kind of things instead of like really one, understanding, hey, what do they really need to know in an age appropriate uh, kind of way? Yeah, I, I want to go back to this idea of, development of coaches, which I agree with you is hugely important. And when we look at the coaching profession, gaining that respect as maybe a dentist would have, we, we don't have that in large part because we rely on this massive cohort of volunteers. Mm -hmm. And just like you, I was in the same boat. My son was six. Tim, you know, we need you to coach. Well, fortunately, I know what I'm doing in this situation and we're okay. But a lot of those, a lot of those are parents and volunteers who just don't have the experience. And, right. and I've, I've approached organizations about providing that, that education for them. Let me give you a one hour session where we cover basic health and safety um, on a field where we talk about how to run a basic practice and what a warm up is, et cetera. And the response I get is that, well, the coaches won't, we won't get coaches. <laughs> because they're not willing to spend that that one hour, you know, learning to do all these things. And, and I had a, a conversation earlier this week on on FSU Coach with uh, Kathy DeBoer, who's the executive director of the American Volleyball Coaches Association. Um, and, and she kind of intimated the same thing. If we start re requiring training of all of these people, we will we will not have coaches. Mm -hmm. So how do we balance this idea of, look, we need to make sure our coaches are at least have fundamentals in when they coach, but recognizing that there's that juxtaposition of if we do that, we may not have enough people willing to do it. 
Yeah, that's a that's a good question, and I think uh, you know we we need to tease that apart a bit. So, you know, the first question I would ask is when we make an assertion about something like, "Hey, if we institute training, coaches are not going to want to coach." So, my my first question is, what's the evidence to support that? Mm-hmm. You know, so let's make sure we're clear about what's really true. And at the same time, I do think that there is a concern about uh, overloading coaches with lots of different training. And, uh, you know, that's a real thing, too. You know, so I go to work every day. uh, I'm getting to the field. uh, I'm getting there 15 minutes right before, uh, you know, my players are getting there. I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing. You know, so like I've got all of that stuff that I'm grappling with as well. I do think, again, this is not a easy answer, uh, but I, I do think, uh, or I should say it's not simple, but I do think we have some easy answers. Uh, and I think part of it is like really getting clear about, hey, what's the, uh, what's the pathway uh, around coaching? So let me back that up and tell you what that means for me. So what is it that uh, from a competency perspective, we think coaches should have? And I think we need to unpack what that is uh, so that we're really clear about the kinds of things that uh, a coach should have. And just as with anything else, we don't give you something in, with a fire hose that you got to have it all uh, at one time. Uh, and I think it's, you know, and part of what we're looking at doing, and this is the very thing, one of the very things that we're looking at, hey, what are the competencies that coaches should have? What are the competencies that uh, youth sport administrators should have? And we're in the process of out of that, beginning to develop what the appropriate curriculum may be. Use the word curriculum uh, a bit loosely, but I do mean it in that way. And thinking about that uh, in terms of then creating a profile for uh, youth sport coaches uh, and then helping a coach understand what their journey is. So, Here are the things that you should know. Here is the sequence that you should know them in. And then here's the pathway over your coaching career uh, that you've got to to take that on. So that's how I see it. That's the approach uh, that we're taking. And, um, you know, more to come around that real soon. Mm, I'm going to be interested to see that, what you come up with in that respect. When we when we look at uh, coaching, you mentioned that, that most coaches, if they do get educated, it's on the the how to's of the sport, you know, the technique, the strategy, and so on. Uh, but more and more in all of these interviews, I'm 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 hearing that it's that's not as important as many of the other facets of coaching, which are working with the athlete, caring for the athlete, being organized, preparing budgets, etc. Is that what you're seeing as well uh, from from your perspective, looking at all different sports or or is it still the case of, well, coaches, you know, it's it's still about performance on the field and somebody better be able to throw that throw? No, I mean, I think most of the most of the attention and most of the and therefore the training is around the the technical kind of things. And. You know, if you even think about how we talk about uh, youth sports, and, and I think herein lies part of the challenge is, again, what are the specific outcomes uh, that we want to get to? And short of being able to articulate uh, outcomes uh, for youth sports, what you coaches, uh, administrators, even parents, what you're left with is things like, Hey, the, did this team win the U9 championship last year? Or, you know, like what tournaments did they travel to as somehow being a proxy for a quality, uh, right. a quality program? And so, you know, to the extent that we begin to dig in on those issues around outcomes, uh, I think, you know, for our administrators, the focus will be different for our coaches. Uh, the the focus will be different, and for parents, uh, the co- you know it'll it'll be different. So I want to tell you just two quick things that that are top of mind for me around this. Sure. One is a personal thing, and one is uh you know something that I was talking with a buddy of mine about. 
And I'll start with the uh, the personal. You know, my my son is a you know is a wrestler. He's had some uh, success with that. And you know, as a parent, you love that kind of stuff. You know, to see your kid uh, succeed and you know get to the next level. And and he competed at the uh, the state wrestling uh, tournaments here in Georgia and so forth. You know, and the things that I've been most proud of is the struggles that he's had and the things that he's learned as a result of that. Um, you know, and I think that gets to, you know, some of those life lessons that will serve him well when he becomes an adult. Um, and you know, even before then, you know, as he goes through college, you know, there'll be things that he draws on from that. Um, and those are the kind of things that I think are important. Uh, quickly, I want to just share a story. I was talking just yesterday with a friend of mine who is in the youth development space and, you know, his daughter plays soccer and, you know, he doesn't know anything about soccer, really. But what he said to me was, hey, what I do know is youth development. And so, you know, I took those principles into the practices and the games and, you know, things went great. Now, that's helpful when you've got younger kids. Clearly, it becomes a little bit different as you get a little bit older and then some of that tactical stuff becomes much more important. But you know, important to understand that as we understand that youth development piece, it goes a long ways. And most folks don't have that. I, I agree. I uh, agree very much so. Um, okay, last question for me then. You you mentioned a little bit about this, this idea of success of a program is based on success of the program. How many wins do they have? How many trophies do they have, et cetera? And we, we in the U.S. live in a very transactional world of records, win-loss percentage. And, you know, coaches, even in my program, will talk about the fact if I don't win, I don't have a job. It doesn't care. It doesn't matter how much my athletes love me or invested in the program, et cetera. That doesn't, that doesn't count. And so in, in a world of, in a world of, you know, club sports, et cetera, where it's all about status and, and winning and recruiting those, those X, Y, and Z players into your program because you're the best in the region or country, et cetera. How do we, how do we change some of those coaching mindsets? And, and I would argue parent mindsets as well, away from transactional to that transformational. So instead of putting that, that 10 year old in this position based on their physical dimensions now, because we've got to win our state title now, I'm going to let you play these seven different positions so that you can learn all of them because we don't know what you're going to be when you're 16. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, any recommendations for, for, you know, coaches trying to work with parents or sports administrators trying to work with coaches to, to change that perspective? Yeah, again, uh, very complex uh, question with lots of <laughs> Sorry. layers to it. Uh, no, really, it's um, you know, and I and you know, I'll try to peel back some of that. So, you know, there are I. So first of all, I, I would say is what we're doing now is that working? And mm -hmm. in some cases, yes. Uh, is it working for all of young people? Uh, if I were to look from that perspective, I would say no. Uh, and so, you know, right now we've got a very few uh, that are doing extraordinarily well. And typically, you know, that's because they're able to access, uh, you know, programs because they're able to pay for them uh, and, and, and the like. Um, and so, you know, there's a couple different ways to think about, you know, this question that you're posing. So one of them is there's room for everybody at the table. You know, there's there's room for uh, those recreational programs. There's room for uh, those community based programs. There's room for uh, the pay for play. There's room for high performance. And I think the real question is, how do all of these pieces fit together? I come back to this issue of outcomes. And if we're able to start identify them and you're going to be hearing more from us uh, over the, the coming weeks around an outcome uh, approach, uh, outcome-driven approach, 
Uh, I think that's going to be one of the first places to look. So no matter what space you're in, you're actually clear about why you're doing what you're doing. I don't want to discount the pressure that some coaches may be facing with the needing the need to win. Uh, we know that's a real thing too, uh, at some level. Uh, I wouldn't say that's a real thing like at the at some of the the youth level at the club sure. level. Uh, I wouldn't say that that's a real thing, although we made that a thing. And then right. lastly, one of the things that I would just share is, you know, I think it's important for administrators to really convey what type of program uh, you may be running and what the intentions of that program are uh, with your parents so mm -hmm. that they collectively can then look before a season starts, before they sign up uh, in terms of what they're getting into. So can I expect in this program uh, for all young people to play? Or will you, you know, like, what's the story with that? So, you know, when we're in that situation now, I'm not been out of shape because, you know, my kid's not playing. Uh, I know that up front or not. And a lot of times those are the kind of conversations that are not being had. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think parents may come in with some presuppositions about what their child is going to achieve in said position or, or situation. And maybe the coach does not necessarily tell them the truth in fear of we may lose that player or they may go somewhere else and we lose that revenue. So definitely worth doing that up front and ensuring that the parent understands what the situation is. Yeah, that could be. And I would say that it's not necessarily just a revenue driven issue. I've, again, I've been in the nonprofit space where even in that space, you've got uh, a team of 12 and six players are playing in that setting. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, again, it's good for parents to know up front, hey, listen, this is a developmental program. This is our philosophy. Uh, you know, this is whatever it may be so that there is, can be that kind of level setting. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think everything works well when everybody also understands their role. You know, yeah. let, the, uh, let the coaches coach, you know, let the uh, players play and uh, let the parents cheer is, you know, kind of my perspective. Yeah, I like that. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk with me today. If somebody's watching this in the future on our YouTube channel has a question for you that, that wasn't answered today, how can they reach out to you? Uh, you can always uh, reach me by email. Uh, email is uh, simple, Wayne, uh, W-A-Y-N-E, at ncys.org. So Wayne at ncys.org. Well, Wayne, thanks once again, and thank everybody for watching. Uh, just a reminder, we have interviews all throughout the year on our YouTube channel, so be sure to go there and subscribe. But on behalf of myself, Tim Baghurst, and Wayne Moss, thanks so much for watching. Hey, thanks for having me.